There's something really special about being a kid playing a video game for the first time. You mean to tell me that I've got this magical box that can show me any world that I want, as long as you own the game, and I can explore the whole thing? <laughs> Get me in there, let's, let's go, come on, I want to see everything. And then you end up running around in circles and cliff diving because you don't know how to control video games. Video games are very unique in how they deliver an experience, and there's really no other medium like it. There's a whole rule set, a language that is spoken across every single game you play, and it goes completely unnoticed. Except when it's missing. If you're a veteran gamer, then you are fluent in that beautiful language of how games work. But when you're a kid, this language has not been learned yet, and the boundaries and limitations that are placed on you in a game are not apparent. Not to mention, you're also just garbage at using the controller, so you know, you can't make a single jump without having to look at the controller and stop everything just so you can find the button and then you end up missing the jump anyway. Now normally I wouldn't start a video by telling you to watch someone else, thanks for watching by the way, but there are two series on YouTube that actually illustrate this language far better than I ever could. Those being Gaming for a Non-Gamer by Rasputin and How Your Parents Can Play by Etra Games. Now Rasputin runs informal experiments on the lady he lives with, aka his wife, by having her attempt to play a game with no assistance or hints, and he studies how his wife figures out and understands how games work, how the games teach or not, and what skills they expect the player to come prepared with. It's a very well done series that I highly recommend watching if that interests you, which it probably does because you clicked on this video. The other one, Etra Games, who I just discovered has two more channels that delve into the Gaming for Non-Gamers topic, goes into what is confusing and overwhelming for new slash non-gamers, and then goes a step further by modding either the game, the controller, or both in order to make an experience easier to figure out and digest, leading to more excitement and fun rather than frustration. He even made his own FPS controls basics tutorials. Tutorials? tutorial, and as far as I know is still working on it and similar experiences. Again, I highly recommend these videos, what they add to the gaming community as a whole in helping new players as well as helping us understand ourselves is invaluable. Links in the description. So now that I told you to screw off and go watch someone else's video, why on earth am I still talking? What, what do I have to add to the conversation that hasn't been said a million times before? I don't know. Can, can a guy just talk? Can a guy just complain? Share his meaningless and, and, and uninformed unoriginal thoughts on, on gaming and topics like that on the internet? Like a funny disease called Shark Pool 9000 and Plague Inc? Do, what, what, spread me like a disease, baby. Share me across the internet. Let's go. Now, one of my favorite things about the language of gaming, beyond technical things like gameplay and gaming mechanics, is the the physical language like like words and phrases because gaming has brought many phrases to the forefront of culture that has people saying things that they would never say in normal context you know, you've got straight people being like all right he's on top he's on top he's coming in the back door he's coming he's coming there's two of them there's three there's three in the back door i'm down i'm down he's finishing me he's finishing me and you've got people who don't have kids being like he's one and then you got city folk being all like i gotta get up early tomorrow so i can water all my crops and feed the animals so i got time to head on down to the river and catch me a large mouth bass so i can give it to the pretty young lady that lives next door because i'm trying to raise her love stat you see and then one day we'll get to get married and then we'll then we'll settle down and then we'll have kids and I'll be able just to spend the rest of my life sitting on the farm going on walks through the woods and enjoying nature just the way that that, the, that God meant it to be you know the way that God intended now like I said those are very literal forms of language as far as phrases go there are many more as well but we've also got specific words in gaming as well we've got strat loot grind, buff, nerf, and my least favorite, meta. Okay, so hear me out for a moment because I'm gonna go on a little bit of a tangent here. I understand that in a competitive game like Apex or any game with a live service, there are going to be balancing and, and some weapon updates and changes and certain things will rise to the surface as the best because when competing, People want every advantage they can get to win. Unless it's a game like Jackbox, where the meta is sex or racism. 
So it makes sense that there would be an ideal way to play so that you have the best chance of achieving a sweet victory royale and then you can default dance on their grave. But if I were to put two people of equal skill together and gave one of them the very good meta guns and the other one the bad guns, who do you think's gonna win? Uh, it's the guy with the good guns. Um, spoiler. Spoiler. I get it, I get it. It's acceptable, it's understandable, and it's also how real life works. You want your thing to do the thing better than the other guy's thing does the thing, so you can win, but in single player games. There is no reason for you to be looking up a so-called meta in a single player game, especially one that is heavily story based. Who are you trying to get an advantage over? I remember when Star Wars Jedi Survivor came out and literally not even 48 hours later after its release, I was seeing videos like, this is the best lightsaber stance in Star Wars Jedi Survivor. You need to equip this to beat Star Wars Jedi Survivor. These are the top five perks in Star Wars Jedi Survivor. Number eight will make you verbally abuse a minor online. And other stuff like that, like the so-called secret Boba Fett appearance. Sorry about the spoilers. Newsflash, games like that were meant to be played for fun. There's literally no competition unless you're speedrunning. There are different ways to play it because different people play games differently and it makes for a much more interesting experience when you can try something that you wouldn't normally do or if you just challenge yourself. Some stances work better in different situations anyway. I remember when I was playing through my first time, I was changing my lightsaber stance every chance I got. I was constantly switching it up and, and depending on the story beat, I would change my lightsaber stance as well. I would pick one that matched how Cal was feeling in that moment. Like, ooh, ooh, he's going a little dark side? Ooh, let me pick the aggressive double saber stance, dude. I'm freaking, I'm out here, I'm freaking out here running around like Darth Maul, making sectors unclear. I don't, I don't think that bit was worth it. <laughs> it was much more fun to experience the game at its full potential, to see everything it has to offer, every strategy, even if it's not ideal, even if it's not the best way to get through. Tangent over. I'm sorry. To get back on topic, the language here that I just mentioned is pretty literal. It's specific words and phrases, but it's also deeper than that. It's an understanding of aspects of a game and the functions of them, and you really only get to know these through the experience of them. Even seasoned gamers will take some time to get used to a new game and learn that specific game's controls and mechanics, but pretty soon, they will be able to see the strats and different builds and ways to cheese the AI. The difference between a seasoned gamer and a new one is that the veteran will catch on to a new game's language much faster simply because most games share the same ideas and functions. There's an expectation when it comes to certain features and quality of life changes that make for a rougher experience if they aren't there. These features that are widely featured across thousands of games in the industry are there simply because they convey information and suggestions in such a quick and subtle way that you don't even know that you're being led somewhere. Is there a light at the end of a generally dark area? Guess what? You're being deliberately drawn to that area where the game designers want you to go. Is there a convenient line of collectibles in a row? Guess what? You are literally following breadcrumbs. And if these simple design choices were missing, it'd be a lot more frustrating to find out where you need to go next. To point you to someone else's videos again, Game Maker's Toolkit on YouTube goes way in depth on specific design features in games and what they do and how they work. He does a very good job explaining why things are the way they are when you didn't even know that some of these designs were deliberate. Now I think personally, one of the best examples of the nature of understanding the gaming language is the change you experience as you get older if you continue to play games. When you're a kid playing a game, it doesn't matter how good you are or how good the graphics are. What matters is what's happening. The adventure, the story, the environment. You're going into it like, I am an elite soldier of the greatest army in the galaxy, and it is my job to ensure that we defeat the enemy so that we can finally bring peace to the galaxy and I can finally settle down and rest my poor, poor war-ridden soul. You're looking at games as what they are. It's as if you're physically being transported into a different realm where magic is real and lasers can kill. Suddenly you're burdened with responsibility, but it's a fun responsibility, and you come back when you die, so you can come back and try as many times as necessary. The galaxy will be saved even if it takes me all afternoon. However, there is a shift that you experience as you get older. 
You begin to look deeper at what you're playing, the mechanics, how the AI works, and before you know it, you're seeing, and in some cases, exploiting the cracks in the programming. The change comes slowly, but you stop seeing the world as a magical place where you have to do whatever it takes to save the Galaxy Queen, and the opportunities are endless, and instead start to see it as a bunch of tasks that need to be completed in order to beat the game. Simple things like out-of-bound areas stop being weird places you just can't go or aren't important and transform into invisible walls. You understand that there isn't actually any more world over there and that it simply ends just outside of the camera's view. Same thing goes for fake doors. They make the world seem more expansive, but they're really just fancy walls. Enemies stop being enemies to fight and become a list of stats and strategies in order to overcome an obstacle in your way. Now this isn't always a bad thing, in fact, it actually shows a sign of growth and mastery, being able to understand different obstacles and overcome them faster. It's kind of bittersweet to realize you're no longer in awe at, and wonder at the worlds you inhabit, and rather the biggest concern you have is when the next season is going to come out. One of the games that I really enjoyed was Alien Isolation. When it released, it was a terrifying experience with an alien that was genuinely scary to face. Everywhere you went, you had to come up with new ways to sneak around it and outsmart it while it would always be stalking you, seemingly around every corner. The game was praised for the AI system that controlled the alien, making it seem alive and as if it was actually hunting you. And it does a damn good job of making me piss my little boy shorts. AI in Games, yet another YouTube channel that I recommend you watching, has two videos on the subject of the alien in Alien Isolation. He goes in depth about how the AI actually works and the way that it perfectly replicates a creature hunting you. But now that I know how the alien works, it's no longer some horrifying entity that I'm trying to avoid, but instead it's become a, a series of systems and meters that I need to avoid triggering. And it's something to cheese rather than something to fear. The magic, the mystery, the realism has all faded away. The childlike wonder that we desperately want to hold on to has vanished. This is what happens as we get older and begin to question how things work or why they are a certain way. So what's the point? What is the point of this video? Why am I saying all this random crap talking about the language of gaming? Well, I hear a lot of people saying things like, Oh, gaming is boring now. Gaming isn't fun anymore. Gaming was a lot better when I was a kid. And to a small extent, I would agree. I think that the gaming industry is partly to blame for that feeling with the yearly releases that hardly have any changes, nearly all games having some form of battle pass or daily login rewards, microtransactions, predatory loot boxes, live services everywhere you turn, games not being released in a finished state. But the truth is, you probably aren't doing your part to make games fun either. If you're saying this, and I go and check your library, and all you have are the last four Call of Duties, three FIFAs, and GTA? I'm taking away your Xbox, okay? I'm sorry, your, your gaming privileges have been revoked. Hand over your gamer card. There are so many games out there across so many genres that it's really impossible to say that gaming isn't fun anymore. Most of the people who feel video game burnout really only play one genre, and if they are playing other things, then they're limiting themselves in some way or another. AAA games are typically not the way to go, especially these days. Even though there are a few developers that are still making games for the player, it doesn't change that even those good games can have some evil corporate practices. What you need to do is go find some highly acclaimed indie games or play some games from your childhood. Play some classics that you've never played before. Take a step back and stop trying to buy the next new thing and buy something that was critically acclaimed that came out 5-10 years ago. Just take a moment to analyze what you're playing, why you're playing it, and how you're playing it. The best way to continue to enjoy games is to try something new. The goal is to recapture that childlike wonder and excitement. The innocence of not knowing everything leads to discovery, which keeps that wonder alive. You'll never be a kid playing your favorite game for the very first time again, but you can always become childlike when seeking something new or in a new way. We all know the language of gaming, but maybe we should seek out something new where we are no longer fluent. And don't ruin it by looking up how to do things the best or whatever the meta is. The way, just, just do it the way you like. <laughs> like, peak efficiency isn't always fun. 
And I think, uh, I think, I think that's all the useless opinions that I have. Uh, so I think that'll be it for this video. I hope, uh, it wasn't <laughs> as unfocused as I feel like it was. I feel like I kind of went all over the place. Um, it made it a bit longer than it needed to be. I hope my opinions don't make too, too many people angry. <laughs> I hope, uh, nobody, nobody comes to murder me in the comments, although they probably will. Somebody will. Somebody's going to be mad that I called out only own, owning Call of Duty and FIFA. Someone's going to hate me for that, for sure. Um, but yeah, thank you everybody so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Um, we're growing. We're chugging along. I'm really excited. I love seeing all your comments. Uh, feels great. Just feels good. Feels good. But yeah, I'd like to hear uh, your thoughts. Do you agree with me? Do you think I'm wrong? Leave your uh, video suggestions in, in the comments. I love reading those. I uh, could, might make them in the future. I have a couple ideas that I'm, I'm starting to work on. A couple things chugging along. Uh, but video ideas, always welcome in the comments. You want me to talk about something specific, my opinions, or maybe just like talk about something. I'll do that. I don't know. I don't even remember. I was going to say something else. I don't even remember what that is. This this is a 30 minute video, so it's going to be a really big file. So um, yeah, thanks for watching. Keep doing stuff and I will see you in the next video.